Welcome back to North American Eternal Weekend 2023, and we are here to bring you our vintage top eight. I am Kevin Crone, joined again by my longtime friend and co-host, Steve Meneni. And welcome, Steve. Great to be here. We have a ton of exciting vintage to bring you for the rest of this morning, and we're going to start, though, with some of our some of our backup information. We're going to talk about our bracket here in just a second. But first, what are these players playing for? Well, the coveted Black Lotus painting. You can see first place has a nice cash prize and some other equipment, but everyone here wants to walk away with this Black Lotus painting today. Of note, the top eight also receives, every, every participant has already received their awesome unique mental misstep promo too and you see the rest of the prizes down there to the to ninth uh, through 16 and 17th through 32. we'll see if we can uh, award this black lotus painting to some lucky person today but first we want to thank our sponsors as you know card titan bringing us this whole event and they have a promo code for 10 percent off all weekend that is eternal weekend 2023 check them out and we also are sponsored by gamegenic gamegenic is offering their supplies with also a 10 percent discount same code eternal weekend 2023 and we thank them for their sponsorship let's see how the bracket shapes up for today's top eight now steve there is a notable constellation of events that have gotten us here today and that is this bracket if you look down the archetypes it features fully three oath of druids and four jewel shops decks uh, can you think of a time when we've had this much of a dipolar kind of top eight in Vintage Champs? Well, there have been occasions where you'd see, for example, a concentration of Dark Ritual decks on one half of the bracket and then Mana Drain decks on the other, or Mishra's Workshop Prison decks on one hand and sort of like uh, Turbo Xeroxy Gush decks on the other. But it's not particularly common. Usually there is one best deck that seems to emerge. It gets like three or four. You know, often it'll be three or four of the decks in the top eight, but this kind of, as you put it, bipolar, you know, two tentpole top eight is pretty unusual. And it's pretty revealing, right, that all of these other really prominent strategies, particularly the Bizarre Baghdad Hollow Vine decks, Dredge decks, they're just not here. Mm hmm. Yeah, there was a, a strong presence, 10% of the metagame or Holovine today, and it didn't quite break top eight. There's a, a number of them in the top 16. And due to the structure of our bracket here, we're going to have a couple of mirror matches in the first round. And so for the sake of a variety for our for our viewers here, we're going to cover the one deck in the top eight that isn't one of the two mentioned, and that is Camden Drash on Azorius Initiative versus Tom Basketball on Jewel Shops. So we what will the, see the we will see the one non oath or shops uh, deck in the top eight here at least for this round, and they're off. Uh, they're just about to get started here, Kevin. I think one of the it looks like we're resolving mulligans. Mm -hmm. One of the upsides to a, a bifurcated top eight like this is that it tells you a lot about the metagame. It tells you where vintage has evolved. We saw that oath was by far the biggest player in this metagame, and so here we go: Pearl Mana Vault, <laughs> Ancient mm -hmm. Tomb. Sensei's, Ooh, Sensei's top. top. Sensei's top with a mana floating. Common play pattern for this deck, spin the top. It looks like, barring uh, a surprise Black Lotus, that we're not going to get a turn one Coveted Jewel from Tom right now, but we'll see what's the, what the top has in store. And Coveted Jewel is really the, what would you call it, Kevin, the accelerant that gets the development card that gets this deck spinning? Absolutely. It is the thing that makes this deck work as well as it does. It filters workshop mana into non-workshop mana, notably. It is a juicy, juicy target for copying. There's lots of opportunities for that across Vintage. This deck prefers Metamorph. And it is just the primary card advantage engine that works with, with or without PO. One more just general note about this top eight is that I don't think viewers are going to be disappointed. In fact, I would say strap in your seatbelts. <laughs> the Jewel deck is incredibly explosive and really fun to watch. Um, and the Oath deck, right, it'll be interesting to see how the Oath deck navigates. I actually think this kind of split top eight will tell us a lot about really the best deck going forward. So I think having that split top eight is actually a boon, right, Kevin? I agree with you. It's going to produce a lot of interesting uh, insights into how these, these metagame shakes out. One of the challenges, of course, is that the Oath mirror, which is happening elsewhere in the bracket, is very miserable. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing, right, is that when you have a top eight like this, either the two different decks make it to the finals and you see which sort of ekes it out, or 
one of them sort of overcomes and takes over the top four, in which case the deck that's best built for the mirror match become the de facto best deck in the metagame going forward. So we learn a lot either way. Um, yep. Getting back to the match, though, Karn, the great creator, has landed, which is uh, super restricted in vintage <laughs> because it's so busted. <laughs> uh, turning off Moxon and then being a sideboard tutor, uh, all of the wishes, um, off the mana vault. One of the things that I have observed, Kevin, from the Swiss is that we saw a lot, a lot of matches where players just didn't play uh, second land. And it wasn't just bizarre decks. It's just these decks can just function off very little land but lots and lots of additional acceleration from the mono red decks to the shop decks to even we saw justin franks and others just play off a single land very much so vintage decks are incentivized to work on as few resources as possible from a mana standpoint for that very reason you see tom here has flipped his top off the top of the library to get a mishra's workshop and then used karn to search out the sideboard argentum masticor which we saw on stream much yesterday now, so right. Tom doesn't have a strong card advantage engine out of the sideboard, like uh, a jewel or something. Those are all in the main deck. But he does have ways to finish the game, like this Masticore here. And so this Masticore quickly applying pressure. Well, the Masticore is a phenomenal answer to Oath of Druids, because in general, Oath of Druids requires an additional turn in order to trigger. <laughs> so the only mm -hmm. way to overcome it is you need the Oath and Time Walk, <laughs> which used to be something you would have to, you know, Time Walk being a very key card in the Oath Mirror because of the ability to generate additional. So, so one of the battles in Oath, as you were mentioning earlier, that makes Oath oh, miserable. Wow. Camden got scoops to the, to the Masticore. Wow. Masticore. One of the dynamics in the Oath Mirror is the fact that Oath of Druids is terrible in game one. You, re, you don't want to be the one to play Oath because if your opponent lands Orchard first, they can use your Oath to get their attraction, their, trigger their creature. And so it is a strange dynamic where you have to basically decide do I keep in any oaths? Do I keep in one oath? <laughs> right? Yeah. Even show and tell is dicey in the mirror. I, you say miserable. I think thrilling. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really want to see an oath mirror here because, you know, the show and tell, very, very interesting. Uh, oath of Druids, interesting. And then the Orchard superiority. But one of the things that I just want to point out about the Master Corps is that it does become pretty decision intensive, what you do. Right, Kevin? It just like Do you discard? Which so. card do you discard? What effect does that have? So what sideboarding cards are you seeing here? Well, Camden's deck gets access to a great deal more removal post-sideboard. He has next to no way to remove permanence in the main, aside from Cathar Commando. The But post-sideboard, he has access to three Fragmentize, which are nice, but notably actually can't kill a Jewel or a Masticore. Three Swords to Plowshares, which are uh, great against Masticores, but quite narrow because the Jewel Shop deck doesn't play many other creatures. And one Null Rod, which is obviously a game breaker against the Shops deck in general. So I think that Camden gained the, the, the Azorius mid-range deck here. I think it gains a lot more by sideboarding than does the Jewel Shops deck in Tom. Yeah, you see here, the beginning of Game 2 starts with a Saga for Camden. As a general rule, these Jewel Shop decks are functionally creatureless. I mean, Urza Saga generates creatures. But these are not these are not creature decks in the traditional sense of a workshop aggro deck, you know, with hangerbacks and uh, ravagers and all those goodies. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, you can't fight them the same way you would have in the past. Azorius has does that look like he's force of willed, Kevin? That's yeah. This is Tom playing turn one time vault. Camden responds with force of will, pitching what looks like force of negation. Tom is considering. Given how easy and mana efficient it is to win with Time Vault, Tom may actually have access to the key with the rest of his hand very readily through a saga or otherwise, but he decides to let the Force of Will go. It's also worth mentioning that the Time Vault there is, is a blue mana with Academy. So there's uh, a double point. He double might be reason. able to play more than we think. Second Saga for Camden is a, a little bit unfortunate because it means he doesn't have a way to activate the first to create a construct, but I'm sure he has a plan. City of Traders, four mana, the one ring for Tom Basketball. Another fun new feature of this archetype, functioning as card draw and defense all in one. 
basically we've seen that if the ring, if the player with ring survives two, basically two more turns, it just becomes an unstoppable downhill snowball in terms of card advantage. Camden uh, resolving his saga triggers, although maybe a little bit out of order. The second one shouldn't be on two quite yet, but still, it's, I don't think anything's going to change that. He it looks like he pulled a mana with the original saga and is now searching. What's he going to get? I would expect Pithing Needle here to shut off this ring. He might. He might need. A colored mana source, though, since he's got his two lands have been sagas. You know, that's a really good he, point. He has everything to do with the, right? The yeah. rest of the construction of his hand will will tell that story. I I could imagine getting the sapphire, but I think he's I think he's that's what he's debating. He's like, should I get sapphire? Yeah. Or should I get the needle <laughs> or lotus? Uh, oh, lotus. Yep. Okay. Well. Black Lotus tells us that Camden has cards to cast. Now, as he was scrolling through his library there, I saw Null Rod in it, which means yes. that we know he's not holding it. So Black Lotus breaks four. Season Dungeoneer. Uh, that's ah. the four mana initiative creature. And presuming it resolves, Camden will take the initiative and then search his library for a basic... Tom is consulting the dungeon now. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> well, compared to the top eight last year, we haven't really seen much of the Undercity. So it's kind of fun to that's see right. it again. I think, I think there's been that's more right. under the Undercity in Legacy yesterday than we saw in Vintage the whole day Friday. So it's fun to see that little grid come back out. <laughs> <laughs> there we see Basic Island chosen by Camden. I expect we'll see that as his land drop for this turn. We'll see what else he this has to follow sense. up with. In essence, he's converted. Look at the chain mi chain uh, migration here, right? He took a a uh, Urza Saga into a Black Lotus into this initiative creature into an island. So we're back to where we began, Kevin. Whether he was considering a sapphire, he just he got there a little bit circuitously. You were right. Through via the initiative gives him access to that colorful mana. And he passes at the turn. Uh, here we go. Ominously, that ring is going to tick up to two. <laughs> I think every time we saw it activate for three, it was just game over. Oh, wow. Tom's hand is full of, of haymakers. It's he's really busted, two. but what he's pinched on, he's got he's all these paradox mobs in place. Exactly. Imagine yeah. how much he would like having that additional blue <laughs> time vault in play right now. You're right. Looks like he was really debating that time vault uh, interaction earlier for this very reason, and it has come home to roost because he has he is really narrow on options. He can it's, he's got he a metamorph, so he could copy something, but his one ring is not a good target for that. No, he'd probably have to metam metamorph with Mox, but also the, with paradoxical, you need permanence, mm -hmm. so that's a draw a draw card too. Even though he has sufficient mana to announce PO right now, it, it, it's at most for two. Which and picking up the One Ring is not your your best use case. So no, he just needs another mod badly. So it looks like he's going to do the metamorph. metamorph. Uh, now it's worth noting he can copy Camden's manifold key, which, as you I, know I from this, time, yeah, has a lot of value in this in this deck and to begin with. What's Camden's I mean, response? This, brainstorm. Brainstorm. Tom Tom is just in firm control in terms of the uh, in terms of the counter magic supply. Okay, looks like Camden drew a force, so he has the option to force here. Mm -hmm. He also drew into Mana Crypt of note, which is just a turn late. He would really love that in play right now to make a construct. If your opponent <laughs> if your opponent has a time vault in play, and you know that your opponent is playing with copy artifact effects, would you ever cast a manifold key <laughs> and do a game board like this? <laughs> that is a, a very real risk in this kind of matchup. You're right to call that out. Not every player would would pick up on that at face value. Camden still resolving his brainstorm. Let's see how much he values interacting with this metamorph. Force of Will pitching Spell Pierce. Now we know that Tom has the opportunity to fight over this, and it seems like he is, without much hesitation. Force of Will back. 
And here we see Metamorph looking like resolving. What does Tom copy? It is a key. Three mana from the Academy. Using one to untap his yeah, own ring. That's good. Yes. Build your own ancestral recall. Let's see if he got another mana source or two. <laughs> Into a real ancestral recall. <laughs> Candon nodding. Nodding. This feels like almost like I don't know, dueling necro decks. Just the just the developmental power that these decks can display, right? That the ability to draw, 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 and then you just either win or you have to pass the turn aiming for a win on the next turn. Um, the key question is, can Tom keep this going this turn or is he going to have to pass? He still has a land Kevin? drop this turn. Uh, he still has a land drop this turn. Oh, so if, if, if he finds... very good for him. Yeah, if he finds Workshop, this could very well keep going. Looks like he's used all his, his academy mana, I mean, he's though. He's got to have like 12 cards in his hand right now, right? I mean, it's like... Right. Wow. Oh, no, He moved to discard. Discarded a superfluous ring. Okay. It's not clear to Camden? me if, if he had the ability to play another land and get rid of his City of Traders or not. So, the under the Undercity... Um, scry 2 on the upkeep for Candon. Saga pulls a mana and then goes searching. <laughs> of note, Camden back down to one permanent mana source again. As you observed earlier, this simply might be going to get Pearl or Sapphire. It, it, it really struck me that we had an inordinate number of games where players had just, I don't know, seven permanents on each side and one land anchoring them. Right. <laughs> just, and and that, I mean, obviously that's to be expected when you're playing bizarre decks, but we saw it across the board. Vintage decks getting fewer and fewer, getting lighter and lighter on lands as the years go, go by. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Sensei's Divining Top. Camden values the selection above everything else we've suggested. Mana, Pithing Needle to shut off the ring. He <laughs> wants he wants options. I, I feel like, okay, so the, stopping the ring does seem a little bit... It doesn't... When your opponent has a completely stacked hand <laughs> and plenty of and really is more bottlenecked on mana, mm. right? That it doesn't seem like actually stopping the ring is actually going to make a difference in terms of the outcome of the game, at least in terms of next turn. So I can see why you would want the top to try and keep your own side going right now, but mm -hmm. I just I wonder if Camden feels absolutely desperate at the moment or and what he what he's going through. I mean, he's down a game. We should we should indicate that he is down a game. Oh, I, I did not realize that. Well, and we know he has one best haymaker in his deck in Null Rod. And you did, well, he scooped to the Master Core, right? Oh, that's right. That's right. He scooped. I, I'm sorry. We we watched that happen. It's just I, I lost track of it because we don't have the uh, the the dot filled in on our screen here. The um. The null rod that he could find would be the one thing that would buy back so much of this exactly. disadvantage. And That's that what he has. Is likely what he's right playing now. toward. Yeah. Yeah. So I think he's basically in desperation mode. Like I've got to find this card. I cannot just impinge one tactic when my opponent probably has a million POs in hand. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fragmentize. That's not bad. Interesting options of what you would hit, right? Yeah. Unclear if he has the mana to cast it. He does. He does. But values Lavinia Ooh. more than said fragmentize. Interesting. I really, I really like that play, actually. Force of will because, from Tom, though. Yes, that that's what I, I like that because it turns his force of wills into uh uh what's the uncounterable force, Kevin? Remind me. The uh, <laughs> The I, I'm not sure which one you're, you're talking about. Counterable counterspell, uh, like a just uh, Dovin's veto. <laughs> there we go. Right. Yeah. And and also it really prevents the PO from going haywire. So I like I like that play. I like at least trying to find something that becomes a little more decisive than picking mm -hmm. something off here. 
You have to believe, though. You you said this it a second it. ago. Tom sets the tempo for the rest of this game. It's it's his game that to lose just, at this point. That is just disgusting, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Tapping, draw four cards. And that key is just sitting there waiting to make it five. It's sick. Tom drawing... Now, well, so he's going to start off by drawing eight yeah. cards here. So he's drawn nine for the turn now. <laughs> Double his hand size. Like, actually, yeah. <laughs> Draw step plus four plus five. This is these are cards ten. He still has top in play if he didn't find exactly what he wanted. There's a couple of moxen. <laughs> and here comes a grim modelist, sure enough. Okay, now Academy has has doubled in production. Tom sits up in his, his chair PO. a bit. Yeah, his he's PO is going to net mana. <laughs> it's gonna <laughs> generate mana. <laughs> the trick is. Can he afford to PO once without tapping Academy? Ooh, all right. So here comes the Might Stone and the Weak Stone, giving Season Dungeoneer minus five, minus five. Interesting that Tom is still somewhat playing for a longer game here. Like I, I'm shocked, honestly. I, I'm actually, yeah, I'm with you. I'm quite surprised. Given PO in his hand, I'm very surprised that didn't simply um, uh, draw two oh, cards. Well, so he's got time walk. <laughs> <sighs> and there we go. Congratulations to Top Basketball. Uh, yep. The only non oath jewel deck has now been eliminated from the top eight. Let's jump to our. Yeah. Our backup deck. Yep. The rest of our matches for this top eight will feature oath and or jewel shops. Here we have our top ranked player, Brian Koval, who appears to be in the midst of game three against Anthony Valentine on PO. And wow, look at this board, Steve. It is a, it is a smorgasbord. This is awesome. <laughs> we have this is awesome. Of everything. <laughs> but Anthony has the trifecta of shops. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, a, and a Trinosphere to begin with too. And it looks like yeah. Anthony and Academy, which is enabling this PO that we're seeing on the stack right now, in the, uh, despite the null rod in play. My guess is this is probably the turn after Oath of Druids resolved, judging by the three tapped lands on Brian's field and the lack of any other creature in play for Brian. So I think th this is Anthony's penultimate... Um, well, I think Anthony oh, had a Graft Diggers... I think he had a Graft Diggers cage. So that's probably why... We, yeah, we can't tell how long the Oath because of the Graft Diggers cage... Um, just for folks who haven't seen this deck, basically what happens here is Oath of Druids, Oath Ups, and Atraxa. The Atraxa immediately enters play, and you look at your top 10 cards, and you basically get massive card advantage. And then it becomes a large creature that sits on the board. There are some sideboard monsters that can come in, like Sarah's Emissary. But um, the key, one of the key counter tactics in Vintage against Oath, especially for Workshop decks, is the Graph Digger's Cage, which prevents the creature from ever coming into play. So... Um, Kevin, this is really fascinating, right? Like, how do you defeat, if you're this Jewel Shop deck, how do you defeat a Null Rod? Well, one answer to that is a Talarian Academy, <laughs> right? The old, and then if you have, I don't know, nine mana off of Mishra's Workshops, <laughs> what happens? <laughs> you can basically just do this over and over again. Oh my oh, God, wow. he's got the, the quad laser Mishra's Workshop. Quad laser shops. Amazing. And, and again, the Trinosphere is there to protect the Graft Digger's Cage, which will prevent Brian from oathing. Brian has to remove that in order to get his game plan going, unless unless he can get the, these creatures into play via show and tell, right? I was just about to say, if Brian has Boseju, this game might be over. Because here we have Upkeep, Untap, Oath Trigger on the stack, Boseju, your Graft Digger's Cage. And that is a non-spell ability. The Force of Wills in Anthony's hand, even though he could cast them, are no good. Here we have no good. the Oath Trigger Terrible. resolving. Mm -hmm. Wow. That Null Rod doing a lot of work. It could be that the three tapped lands last turn, uh, as you observed, were actually Brian tutoring via Demonic Tutor for that Boseju to set up this exact scenario. But either way, here we have Brian revealing until the trick set enters. Mm -hmm. That it's is fairly like one. Yeah, I see one attract in the cell zone. Oh my it god! Looks like he, he has, has one card. Of cards left. <laughs> I think one. I think there's one after that. I think only one. Wow. So there's. So he's gonna he's gonna draw the last card. He's got. He's gonna basically build his library after that. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I think you're going to see Brian. I, I suspect you're going to see Brian decline to take some of the the optional cards here from this attracts a trigger just to bolster the size of his library. Whereas in other scenarios, you might be very excited to have Flash plus that other attracts it in your hand. It doesn't help you this game. This is going to be very interesting to see. We see him taking land and time walk, which are two of the greatest resources he could have found here, and I think he knew that. Mystical yes. Tutor. And I expect him to leave the source, the uh, yeah, the other sorcery, right. no, the enchantment and the creature. Yeah, he chooses not to keep the creature and the enchantment. He he, he needs one more mana though, which is for the to get a play this time walk in the Trinisphere. There we go. Build your library, right. stack your deck. So Time Walk will have to wait. He simply has to pass the turn with only two available mana in the face of Trinisphere. Exactly. We'll see what he can put rock. together. And his yeah. own Elrod. This is this is this outcome is still TBD, I'd say. I would agree with you. It's worth noting that the the Phyrexian metamorphs, which are uh, as we've just just been discussing about the you know a, a tentpole of the outcome deck, do a good job at becoming Atraxes yes. if they want. They really do. And he can play. He could play three, four of them right here if he wanted. If he had all four, <laughs> he could play four Atraxes. <laughs> Anthony uh, just played Ancestor Recall. He tapped two workshops and played Ancestor Recall. <laughs> Still has a mana floating. No, no, he he spent all six on a jewel. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this, it'll be very interesting to see how Anthony navigates this. He's obviously has access to many many cards. There's metamorph right there, there. There's the metamorph. So he's is he? Oh, he's decided to draw cards instead. So he's copying the jewel. Oh no, it's a Yeah, I was about to this, say <laughs> this is the ten card attraction reveal. This yeah, this is fascinating. This is fascinating. fascinating. Brian might have the tools in his deck in order to, um, you know, to survive this situation, well, but well, he might not well, have enough time, is, and he might not have enough of them remaining. Th this is the problem, right? His deck is just too small. The, uh, we might see Brian just deck here. This is the fascinating part, Kevin. Mm -hmm. With the Trinisphere in play, Brian cannot protect his time walk with the Force of Will. So Anthony sitting with that, with that. Um, Academy is basically going to be able to play as many Force of Wills as he wants, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to see Brian play Time Walk. Anthony's going to force it. And there's really nothing Brian can do. And I, if Anthony can just play enough Atraxes, I mean, Brian has one more Atraxan. He can't really even oath it. <laughs> I mean, he, I think he put the... I don't know where he placed it in the library. Well, it was shuffled, but, I, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's... Nothing's far from the top in that library. It's worth noting, though, that Anthony just found Karn. And so he, he can obviously cast Karn and probably his, a selection of anything like, he wants out of his sideboard. Why would, be my would guess. you do that? Why would you tap the Academy? You need well, that. I mean, I guess... Unless okay. it's a game-winning play right here. Yeah. Yes. I, I would think you would just want the Academy up to force what Brian's play. But... Ah, Adawara. Adawara oh from hand. God. Channeled to remove Null Rod, unlocking Anthony's primary yeah. game plan. That is awesome. So let's tell let's tell everyone how, what the text on this Anawara is. Oh, Anawara is another one of the the channel lands from uh, ne Kamigana Neon Dynasty, and in particular, you can channel it to bounce an artifact, which he just did. Just like Buseju removed the Graph Digger's Cage before, that's a destruction. Anawara is the blue version, which can bounce, and that is exactly what Anthony did. Oh my god, he's got transmute artifact. How did I miss this from the deck list? <laughs> he's gonna get key and go off here. That is awesome. Antiquities legend. Yep. Transmute artifact. Oh, and that is going to be game. Now we have to see how Anthony finishes this deal because you know, on board, his Atraxa does not defeat Brian's Atraxa, but we know just due to the nature of the deck construction that Anthony can produce additional Atraxas kind of at will. <laughs> and so he's simply going to take turns, trade his Atraxa off, and we'll see how it goes. Brian has access to three mana now. Let's see how he responds to this situation. Aha, Force of Vigor. That's very interesting. Unfortunately, though, Anthony also has three mana and can simply respond with Force of Will. Let's, I presume that's what's about to happen, but we'll see. We'll see if Brian has some additional response. That's it. That is it. Congratulations, Transmute Anthony. Transmute artifacts for the win. Well, 
We've seeded two of our semifinal spots with Jewel Shops. <laughs> Let's see how the rest come out. <laughs> Amazing. So, it won't be boring. We can promise you that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. There is going to be some explosive magic here. We're going to cut to a break. Let's give us a moment and we'll come right back with some semifinal matchups for you. See you soon. <laughs> 